Well, thank you everyone for joining um, to our Friday call. Um, we have uh, a legendary figure today uh, with us, Kevin Ryan, um, who is known as the godfather of New York Tech. Um, Kevin has um, built some incredible businesses um, from DoubleClick, which uh, ultimately is Google uh, PPC now. Um, uh, he built and uh, I think probably went through the acquisition, but we'll hear more about that. And then uh, successfully helped build MongoDB, um, Business Insider, which I'm sure lots of you you read, um, as well as various other really successful startups. Um, I remember the first time I met Kevin. His apostle office was like, "Oh, you?" I was in New York, and Kev, uh, apostle office like, "Oh, you, you've got to meet Kevin." And I was, I went like, uh, I was like, okay, yeah, no problem. Um, I was super busy that week, and I was back to back meetings. And I was like, um, I remember reading about Kevin before the meeting, uh, and then um, waiting uh, for Kevin to get off a call, and um, so surprised. It's just um, like a real inspiration. Such an incredible guy, very down to earth. Um, and one of the nicest people um, I've ever met and instantly connected uh, with Kevin. I wasn't there even pitching him an investment, uh, I don't think, if I remember rightly. We were just talking. Um, but, yeah, it was, um, yeah, it was really, really one of those people you meet and you go, wow, I'll remember that for the rest of my life. So, uh, And since then, Ali Corp have obviously invested um, and uh, adding a huge amount of value to the business. So we're, we're hugely grateful for everything you and your team have contributed um, as well in terms of helping us drive uh, much better car finance as well. So, Kevin, I'll, I'd love to kick off uh, mm -hmm. and ask you, like, what on earth got you to it? Like, like where did it all start? Like, mm -hmm. how, did you, how did it kind of come to be? Maybe, like, just a bit about how you got into double click and then from there like how on earth you you ended up becoming such a, a very very strong kind of entrepreneur and uh, and and what you learned as a result yeah so first of all really excited to be here loved working with aiden carmel is an incredible company so i know it's just the beginning but uh really an opportunity to build something very special uh so yeah i was you know, my during my 20s i worked for large companies uh i worked for disney for a while I worked uh, for uh, Prudential on the investment side. And by the time I was 30, I was a CFO and COO of a unit of a large media company, uh, but 150 person division. And I started as part of that a website. And this is very early, this was in 1995. Started this website, the website became very successful. I went to the parent company and I said, you know, this internet thing, huge. Someday everyone's gonna be on it's gonna be used for e-commerce, advertising, just things like that that are kind of obvious in retrospect. And they didn't get it and said, no, we're just not sure. We're gonna wait for the next wave. I don't know what they were talking about. And so I said, okay, well then, sounds like you're not part of my internet future, um, but I really am persuaded that this is gonna be big. So I'm gonna go start an internet company. And I ran across two guys. They had a 10 person company at DoubleClick that had already started a company six months before. So it's still very early. And they persuaded me to join them. I became the president and I became the uh, CEO. And we had this unbelievable run where four years later, we had 2000 employees in 25 countries. We went public 24 months after we started. So I spent the four years building that infrastructure, moving incredibly quickly. In fact, DoubleClick today is still the dominant person and it has been 25 years in the ad technology space, partly because we took the lead during that time and have never given it up. And so Double was public for seven years. Um, and then uh, Google bought it in uh, 2007 uh, for about uh, $3 billion. Uh, but it was an exciting ride. But it, I should also mention for anyone who does startups that I talked about the first four years, which were exciting. The next two and a half years were terrible because the internet uh, you know, economy collapsed, the bubble burst. We lost 70% of our clients. Oh. So if you're taking notes, don't do that <clears throat> because it doesn't do good things for your PL. So we did seven rounds of layoffs, very depressing. The stock price went from $120 a share to $5 a share. All the investors hated me. All the decisions I had made uh, looked bad in retrospect. 
but we fought through that. It wiped out all of our competitors, and we became the un indisputed dominant player in ad technology. But really saw like you know twenty years of business condensed into six or seven years. And then just quickly to go on after that, um, I said I'm going to go start other companies. And so uh, in one year, 2008, started Business Insider, Gilt, and Mongo. And all three in their own way became very, very successful. And they were in very different areas. I was chairman of all three and founder, then stepped in to be CEO of Gilt for a couple of years. That was an extraordinary story as well, because in year two, we did $175 million in revenue, which no one in New York has ever done. I mean, think about how much revenue that is. Um, and it's operationally very complicated. Uh, so we had a fantastic run there. And then since then, I just build up the infrastructure. So Alicorp now has, you know, 24 people. We have a big uh, technology organization separate to that. We have multiple conferences. We have a search firm. And so we invest in companies like Carmula or we start companies ourselves. And Kevin, did you just, were those just like chance encounters? Or like, how did it come about? Were you just like actively an angel investor looking at lots of deals? Or did you just say like, I think there's an opportunity here, let's go and build it? You know, Mongo, Business Insider and Guild were companies that I started either by myself or with one or two other people. And so it was our idea, <clears throat> we staffed it, we found a CEO, I found a CEO uh, in all three cases and, and you know, split my time between the three. So I was just a very active chairman. Um, and then was also working on one or two other ideas. I did worked on two other things that ended up not really working that well. Um, so I'd started a total of five companies during a three year period uh, with, and most of them were with a guy who had been the CTO of DoubleClick, who spent most of his time focused on Mongo. That was the best use of his time. He was coding, he was building, he was one of the two technical geniuses behind the product. So we were just building, building companies in an, way that's unusual no one does that many companies and is not ceo but it was a new model a lot of people didn't believe in it but it has worked and it still works today and did you get that like how did you come up with those ideas did you like just were was it from research speaking to people reading ipo perspectives like where where did the inspiration for those businesses come from yeah i mean you never know how you're going to get inspiration but part of it is just thinking all the time about what are the problems? What is not there? What could be done better? What could be done cheaper? So for example, in the case of Mongo, the fundamental question was, you know, in, if you were, when we were at DoubleClick, the single product we spent the most money for and hated the most was our Oracle database. It was outrageously expensive. We had to have all these consultants. It didn't scale very well. And so we just sat there and thought, you know, data, if there's one thing we were willing to bet on was that the use of data was gonna go up by 100X in the next decade. And so there's just no way that was gonna work. And so we just had to sit there and think, could we do that and build something? And it was a different type of database. So relational versus non-relational. Uh, and so that was the realization there. At Business Insider, it was more that I didn't have the publication I wanted to read. Uh, people forget today that in 2007, the Wall Street Journal and Business Week did not update their websites during the day. They were still on a cycle that they'd always been on, which is you publish in the morning, because that's when everyone wakes up, and you you know you finish your stories late at night, and that's just how news works, which made no sense if you started from scratch. So we published all day long. Uh, we had punchy headlines. You know, we had opinionated points. Um, and all those things, of course, are obvious now, so you don't even realize that it was an innovation, but it was at the time. And so the extraordinary story there is we started something by just writing, had three people writing to a, a blog, essentially, never spent $1 in advertising, and today it has 300 million uniques, purely by people just coming and liking it. Um, that's an amazing story. Um... I suppose I've got to ask it, but what was it about Carmula uh, that I guess got you interested or, or excited? Yeah. So, you know, it, it, in a way, it's never that complicated. You have to walk out feeling very good about the CEO and very good about the business opportunity. That the business opportunity means, do you have a product or on your way to having a product that is truly differentiated? Now, everyone thinks they do, but that's the judgment call you have to, to make. And sometimes we get it right, sometimes we don't. But it felt like 
we felt had huge confidence in you. And it felt like this was a product that was just going to be fundamentally or was better than what was offered out there and a huge market. Uh, and so if you can do those two things, you're 70% of the way there. The last 30% is just execution. It's getting the right marketing person. It's getting the right CTO. Uh, it's building up those teams. It's making good decisions. It's not spending too much money. It's not spending too little money. But those are, those are you know, judgment calls along the way. Yeah, that's cool. I uh, thought I'd ask that one. But um, so, like, obviously, now you've kind of moved to, moved on for like, I know you're still actively involved in yeah. lots and lots of businesses building. And I know that you recently raised uh, the first external fund as well for Alicor, which is yeah. um, incredible achievement, considering some of the market conditions we've seen over the last uh, couple of years. So, so that's really cool. Um, but like I know that you're interested in other areas as well, um, and one of the things I thought was fascinating was your um, trip to Antarctic. Um, yeah. the, the, and I'd I'd love maybe that we can uh, talk a little bit about that because I was like, wow, this is like some of the stuff around that. When you told me that the first time, I went away and was like, this is crazy. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear. Like, I know you're doing it for charity as well or for research. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, would love to love to hear some of that. Yeah. So what happened was there. I, you know, I'd always done a number of kind of athletic type pursuits. Uh, I did triathlons for 15 years and love big hikes and bike trips and things like that. And a friend of mine who's in London, actually, and some people know him there, Dr. Jack Kreindler, um, he was had set up a scientific expedition to walk to the South Pole. We would be the subject. So we had to pull our own stuff. So we had a sled with 50 pounds of your tent, all your food, your clothes, everything. Um, in fact, not that you asked, but you also have to carry out all of your poop because you can't leave anything behind. So you first time I've carried an entire week's, you know, collection of frozen poop in my, in my, in my thing, you know, how did, how did it come to that? Um, but you know, it's, um, it's, a, you know, Antarctica is a scientific preserve. And so it is very important that it's kept pristine, um, forever. And so we were wearing glucose monitors. We were wearing Ura rings. We were wearing very special watches that measured everything. We had science, we had, um, psychological interviews every day, blood, urine tests taken before and after. And so then they're putting together papers, writing about how did the bodies react? And part of it was actually funded by the British military. One of the things they wanna do, which is interesting, is five years from now, when they send a special forces soldier out to the Afghan mountains, they wanna be able to monitor him the way they monitor a computer or a tank. And so you can say, oh, you know what? Aiden's glucose levels are, have dropped by 10%. You know, he should not go out tonight or his weight level has gone down, you know, just like anything else. Some people are in good shape. Some people are not. And <clears throat> and it's a real risk when we send a soldier out, not just to you, but to everyone around you, if you can't perform. And so they're testing materials. They want to know what to watch. They want to know how men react versus women. And so uh, we were just a part of that. Uh, but it was a spectacularly beautiful um, expedition. It's an enormous place. You know, it's the same size as the United States plus Mexico. Uh, so we wow. obviously saw a small part so of it. Ha and, and one of the things that I thought was amazing that you were telling me is effectively the ice pushes it all up. So it's effectively uphill. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like it's, climbing a mountain. It, it, except where we were, even though it's slowly uphill, it feels pretty flat, except it's flat and very high. So somehow I missed this in geography class, but it's about, there's about two miles of ice. So you are, where we were walking near the South Pole is at 9,000 feet of altitude, but because the atmospheric pressure is different there, it's the equivalent of being at 11,000 feet in the Alps. Um, wow. So that's another challenge when you are walking for eight hours, pulling a sled, is there's just a lot less oxygen than there normally is. And so how long did it take to go there and back? So the, the, we walked for seven days, eight hours a day. Every night we would just pitch up our tent, get into a very good quality sleeping bag, eat some food and collapse. Um, but it's, a, it's a hard to get there because you have to fly to Chile, get all your equipment that you don't have, verify everything, fly to a base in Antarctica, then uh, for a day or two, do some training and then fly to the drop-off point. 
and then you're just in the middle of nowhere. Wow, so cool. You said, I think you said to me the, when you told me this the first time as well that you had to walk at a certain pace because the yeah. sweat would freeze. Yeah, you really don't want to be you know working too hard uh, and build up a big sweat level because uh, at some point, yeah, it will freeze. The, the real risk there is frostbite. And so uh, out of the seven groups that did our trip, we were the seventh one that season, and we were the first one where everyone actually made it. I mean, everyone was alive, but people had to be flown out because of frostbite, because of snow blindness, and because of altitude sickness. You know, it's uh, high enough uh -huh. that it doesn't kill you there, but it can make you quite sick. And altitude sickness has nothing to do with your physical conditioning. You can be the best athlete in the world and still have a problem. It's more like a peanut allergy. You know, no one would say you're just not in shape. That's why you got a peanut allergy. It's some weird little genetic thing. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, so cool. Um, so I would, uh, I would love to do that. <laughs> so, yeah. um, you, um, so I guess we'll we switch subjects a little bit. And um, I know you're, uh, I don't want to say raver, mm -hmm. or, yeah. uh, but you have quite like an alternative view to to some people. And um, um, I really love that about you. I think like not everyone has that side, side to them. They're either like very serious and very business. But I think like what's really, really interesting about yourself, Kevin, is like not only do you have that real business side, yeah. you also have um, you really embrace life, I guess, and li live it to, yeah. to its full. I don't know. Can you see this picture? <laughs> so that's, that's, yes. that's actually me at, at, at Glastonbury three weeks ago. Um, yeah, fantastic. We, we all wore animal outfits. We looked a little ridiculous, but we had fun. And that's what matters. Uh, so, uh, yeah, um, yeah. So, like, I'd love to hear. Yeah, like, tell us, tell the team about yeah. like some of your experiences with Burning Man and, and some of that stuff. Yeah. No. I, first of all, I, I actually love to dance, and so um, I and I like electronic dance music. So for the last seven, eight years, I've been going to Burning Man, uh, to Garbage, which is a festival outside of Berlin. That's purely electronic dance music, about 8,000 people. It's over the border into Poland, uh, but pretty close to Berlin. Sometimes I'll, I don't go to that many big music festivals like Glastonbury, uh, but it's still it's still fun. So it tends to be more smaller events. Like I hosted a party in Ibiza uh, two, two and a half weeks ago, brought in our own DJs, maybe 120 people. That's the sort of thing I, I, I definitely like doing. Um, and I just find it, it self-selects for a pretty creative group of people. Burning Man in particular. Uh, so love the environment, love the music, love the art, love the psychedelics. I mean, the whole thing together is a great experience. And so what happens on Burning Man for those that aren't from uh, like yeah. not everyone maybe so familiar with it in terms of it's quite like US centric, I guess. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a crazy idea because 75,000 people show up in the desert uh, in uh, Nevada. And everyone has to come in RVs or in tents. There's these various camps that are set up. It's all structured. There are um, 100 art objects, large, large art objects that are there. You can look them up uh, online. They're quite amazing. Probably 30 out of the top 50 DJs in the world are playing for free every single night. Because one of the unique things wow. about Burning Man is that it's a, people always think it's a, a barter economy. It's not. It's a gifting economy. It's an idea that if I explain to you, you will say, will never work. It's so insane, which is that there is no money at Burning Man. You can't buy anything. So your camp, Aiden, your camp provides a yoga studio, yoga classes every single day. And I can just go take yoga classes and you have the mats, you have everything, you have the instructors. My camp provides a nightclub with DJs uh, you know, every night. Another one provides free breakfast. For everyone, it's like an enormous kibbutz, and, wow. and and so you'd think that's not going to work, but it does work, and it makes everyone have this different sense of helping. Like if you're walking on the street in London right now and you're thirsty, no one's going to give you water, right? That's that's just an insane idea. And at Burning Man, people will literally stop and say, "Hey, are you okay? Do you need to drink some water? Here, have some." And you just feel better wow. about society after this. How on earth did it start? Do you know? 
Yeah, it started in San Francisco about 35 years ago. Total hippies, you know, 50 people. And then it just grew from there. So even probably 15, 20 years ago, it was 8,000 people. And now it just it's kept growing. And so it's a very special experience. It's unlike anything else. It has nothing to do with a Glastonbury uh, where there's, for example, Glastonbury has 10,000 pieces of garbage on the ground. You know, great music bands, but the environment is gross. Uh, Burning Man, nothing is on the ground. There is no one throws anything away. There's this sort of caring for everyone else. Wow. That's, uh, that's really interesting. I remember reading a book once about psych psychedelics in, mm -hmm. that came out and kind of invented in California and then just how it kind of then developed into some of the hippie movement. And I wonder yeah. if like in the 60s, 70s, it must um, probably very interconnected. I know that you're um, a big supporter, I guess, yeah. of psychedelics and alternative like treatments Absolutely. and, and different so psychedelics you know, so how, let me yeah, just, where, where did that come from i guess yeah i mean i i just started reading about it in 2017. there's a book that i think everyone should read called how to change your mind by michael pollan which changed the trajectory of psychedelics because he did a great job researching it looking into it and you read the book and you realize that uh you know there are lots of bad drugs out there that you should never do but that psychedelics lsd you know mushrooms things like that are absolutely not addictive and you cannot overdose. Whereas alcohol, you can overdose and obviously it can be addictive. And so they're actually fundamentally safer. But on top of that, there's really some mental health benefits taking it therapeutically. And so that's what is happening in the United States and other places, the research is going through. So that's so if I started a company that's taking a compound through the FDA process, just like any biotech company, and would be given for PTSD or depression uh, or anxiety, you know, with a, a doctor or a therapist. And that process is underway. Uh, ketamine is already legal in the United States for that purpose. Uh, I think mushrooms will be legal in MDMA in the next couple of years. And on our product is probably three to four years away. Okay. And so I understand that. Is that for the purposes? Obviously, it's, it's quite well known. Like, I don't know if everybody knows this, but things like cognitive behavioral therapy, mm -hmm. uh, they started to use psychedelics yeah. so that it basically skips a step, if you like, of removing your sub, like your conscious that kind of really prevents you making any progress, I guess, with the therapy. Is yeah. that effectively what it's doing? Yes, although the, the caveat I will give is that here's what we do know and here's what we don't know. If I took a uh, scan of your brain before LSD and after LSD, I will see that the neuroplasticity in the brain has absolutely increased. So your brain before will look like, a, I say, an internet map of Africa, meaning there are places where there's no lights, there's no connections, nothing going on. And then afterwards, it looks like an internet map of Europe where everything's connected, lots of lights, looks like a roadway that has just been lit up. We know that that's helpful. We don't know everything about why you react a certain way to LSD versus mushrooms versus other things. Um, I remind everyone that aspirin was sold for 50 years on the market and we did not know why it worked. We knew it was safe, we knew it worked, we just didn't know why. And then we figured it out. So the, the, the why in the brain is takes longer. And let's not forget something fundamental. We still don't know what causes depression. You know, you have a friend who's depressed. You know, is it genetic? Is it something that just happened to them? All kinds of things, some patterns, not clear. So we just don't understand the brain well enough, but we do know definitively because there've been 300 academic studies, double blind, take a hundred people, 50 get mushrooms, 50 get a placebo. The only way that there's a difference is because uh, the mushrooms worked and it helps in all these categories. In fact, in helps. The, it, it, it helps in, li in line with therapy. Like Yes, it always has been given so far with therapy, but um, the, when, it's, when the, you get a sugar pill, you also get the therapy. So in both cases, you're getting therapy. Okay. The only difference is, is let's say the, the mushroom or MDMA, 66% of the people who had 
treatment resistant PTSD. That means they've had it on average for 11 years and they've tried two modalities to solve it and it didn't work. So obviously that's a difficult situation. And the vast majority of people either are sexual assault victims or war veterans. These are hard cases. And 66% of the people who took MDMA as part of this trial, six months later, were diagnosed with zero PTSD. To put in perspective, no other thing we've ever done has hit 30%. And here we are at 66%. That is a drop the mic, mind blowing number. And so eventually that will be approved and will have a huge impact. Right now, a lot of people do it in sort of an underground way. You know, both the US and the UK don't really pursue this. I was actually at a conference two months ago with Amanda Fielding, who is the OG in psychedelics in the UK. You know, it was encouraging because she's done it over 2000 times and she gave an analysis of brain scans at the age of 81 years old. So her brain's still working really well. So that, that bodes well for the rest of us. Wow. Yeah, like I like I, I think I told you before, but I've done a lot of uh, cognitive behavior therapy, mm -hmm. uh, struggled with things in the past. And um, for me, like one of the hardest parts is like, number one, building trust with the therapist. Mm -hmm. Number two, you know, like getting to a state in which the therapy, like where you're able to turn, like in some ways turn off some yeah. of your conscious being. Mm -hmm. And I can really see it potentially how those drugs could really accelerate that and enable you to go level deeper than yeah. what you can in just traditional therapy. Uh, so for me, like I would love to, uh, to see progress there. I think it will help so many people. Um, oh, yeah. um, no, I had a friend who had but, 10 years of therapy and then he did a session with psychedelics and he called me up and he said, I don't know why I spent 10 years in therapy because I just made more progress in one afternoon than in my 10 years. Wow. Yeah. My, um, is, it, is it legal in the UK to do that? No, none of these are, are legal right now. I don't know what the status of ketamine is right now, but no, they're, you know, most, you're, you're, so the UK is ahead of most other countries in Europe, uh, but behind the United States. The United States, it's now legal, mushrooms are legal in Colorado and in Oregon, and it'll be on the ballot in Massachusetts uh, this fall. So on the state level, things are moving forward. And at the national level, the FDA is, is going through its normal, relatively slow process to approve. And so do you like now regularly like take any like drugs or like in terms of just to like help with creativity? Because in that book, I think they talk about lots of people taking like micro doses. Yeah. Is that something that you, no, you do? I I, I don't do any microdosing at all. And I would say that the studies do not show so far that microdosing, you know, has an impact. Whereas what I call macrodosing absolutely has an impact. I know many people who have microdosed and feel that it's working, but a lot of that is a placebo effect. If I give you a pill and tell you, Aiden, you're going to feel better and happier and more creative. You just might the next day say, Hey, I think I feel great when it was, it was a sugar pill. Um, so that's what we have to separate out. Uh, no, I think for me, and I don't, I don't really have any mental health issues. Um, but recreationally, I find it very enjoyable once a month, if I'm going out with friends to a club or a concert or something like that, or going sometimes for a, a long hike in nature, um, being careful about dosage. If I gave you a very big dose, you're not going to be able to go to a, on a hike. You need to lie down. So you don't want to do that in the middle of a hike. So you need to know what you're doing. Psychedelics are like alcohol. You know, having a glass of wine, great. With a friend, no problem. If you said, I'm going to have, you know, eight shots and then drive a car or even go on a hike, that's probably a really, really bad idea. And so don't do that. So dosage is extremely important. And so what does it do? Like it effectively, like when you're doing it on a hike, it, well, it just enhances your yeah. connection with the nature or? Yeah, so mushrooms in particular, for example, my wife and I were on a hike and, you know, we, we, this is going to sound like a stereotype, but we, we saw a butterfly. You've seen a butterfly before. But we all of a sudden have this focus, go up to the butterfly and are just staring at it for probably 30 seconds. So we're not seeing anything that wasn't there but we're appreciating 
something that you would have just walked by and said, hey, yeah, there's butterflies around. And then when you do it again to another butterfly, you realize that the next butterfly has a different pattern and it's so beautiful. And you're sitting there thinking, nature is extraordinary and this is so delicate and small and incredible. And what is what is its life like? So all these things make sense when you're on mushrooms. Um, but the truth is you're just appreciating it more than you did in your normal life. It slows you down and, and gives you focus. And one thing I would say is that, you know, psychedelics, especially mushrooms and LSD, can accentuate how you're feeling. So set and setting are important. So if you're in an environment where you don't have friends around you, it's hostile in some way, if you're on psychedelics, you might feel worse about it. And if you're with great friends in your living room, hanging out, you'll just think, oh my God, I love my friends so much. This is really great. Um, I feel fantastic. So, you know, I do think you wanna think about both the dosage and when and where you're taking it. You know, this is something that's wrong. And the other thing is that anyone who has a risk of bipolar psychosis should not take psychedelics. Uh, it's not helpful. We're still trying to figure out their relationship. Um, so, you know, I think people need to be careful in the same way that everyone takes for granted. I assume no one on this call is going to have five glasses of wine and drive home because that would be a dumb shit thing to do. Um, but everyone knows that, but unfortunately in psychedelics, they just don't know what amount, things like that. So you want to be cautious. Okay, cool. Hopefully Ollie, our head of compliance, doesn't want to make any disclosures or <laughs> uh, comments uh, around that, but we are not giving drug advice. Uh, we, we, we are not. I'm talking about my it. experience, it. not yours. <laughs> and I just said, be uh, but yeah. Um, and so, like now, like I, I since seeing that you guys, uh, uh, Alicorp, are really heavily trying to do a bit more philanthropy, philanthropy and yeah. giving back more like yeah. uh, like i'd love to hear some of the kind of initiatives uh, sure. that you guys have going on there yeah we have two big ones going on one we just did a um a pitch competition for underrepresented founders so basically black hispanic female founders we all know in our industry that uh we we uh, are th th those groups are severely underrepresented and so we had 500 submissions and we committed to a million dollar investment in the winter. And we did that. Um, hopefully it encouraged a lot of people to submit ideas. Even if we didn't fund this one, someone else will fund it. Uh, we gave some um, you know, peer coaching, things like that to these people. So that's something we did the first half of the year. We also have an initiative where, uh, because we have this engineering company that has 75 engineers, we actually have engineering resources. And so we did something that no one's ever done is we said, if you're a nonprofit, no nonprofit can get enough good engineers because they just can't pay enough money to get the top engineers. And so we offered $250,000 worth of engineering time to a nonprofit in the form of a donation. So they have a project they want to build. We will build that for them at our cost and, you know, and give it to them essentially. And so technically it's a nonprofit donation from me, but the team executes it. And we were involved with some really interesting projects in literacy, um, LGBTQ rights, things like that. Wow, that's really cool. Fantastic. Um, uh, I want to hand it over to the team because I'm sure based on that, there's going to be uh, hopefully some questions. So um, does anyone have a question they want to ask Kevin uh, to, to kick off with? Probably someone. Go on, Dimitri. Yeah, but thank you for the interesting story. Uh, basically, all the questions probably will, will be about the, the your uh, studies and experience with the, um, some uh, I don't know influence of these liquids or mushrooms <laughs> and all other stuff. Yeah, I have basically two questions. Like the first one will be about the possible side effects uh, because it. Everything sounds really cool when you like that there are some studies, uh, you have like the results that it like in positively influenced the people. But uh, what about like side effects? Maybe uh, I'm like talking about the uh, good doses, not overdosing. Like yeah. The... yeah. So 
it, then it, it depends. The, the drugs I'm really talking about are MDMA, mushrooms, LSD, and ketamine. And each one is a little bit different. So MDMA is technically not a psychedelic, although it's lumped in with them, uh, because you don't see anything different. You feel a little bit different, but you don't see anything different. Whereas if you are on mushrooms or LSD, you can start to see, you know, things moving in a way. Um, it truly can be psychedelic. So with, with MDMA, um, it just is a heart opener. It brings up serotonin. There aren't a lot of downsides except for the next day, some people have a kind of emotional hangover. Not a physical hangover, but they can feel down. And it happens a little bit more, I think, to women than to men. And we don't know why. For example, my three kids who are all in their 20s, um, two of them will feel down the next morning. And so they don't think MDMA works for them that well. And then one of my kids doesn't have that. I don't have that at all. So you, unfortunately, you can't figure out that without trying it. it. People don't get suicidal. They just feel like, oh, I don't have energy. I don't feel great. Things like that. Mushrooms and LSD, as I was saying earlier, can have what people would call a bad trip. They just, like, I'll give you an example. A friend of my son's was at university. He took a test. He's pretty convinced he failed it. Many people in the past have gone to the bar and had a bunch of drinks. That's been done for a long time. He took LSD, and then he spiraled for a couple hours thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to drop out of university. I'll be homeless for the rest of my life. My parents will disown me, none of which was going to occur. But that's what was going on in his mind. And so that, it, again, it lasts for several hours. He can feel very uncomfortable. And that's that's a risk. I mean, you are playing with your brain a little bit. I, like I've done psychedelics probably 70 times. I've never had a bad experience. But, you know, you do have to think of that situation and who you are and what works for you. You want to do it with other people around. Um, people need to look out for each other in the same way that, you know, if people are drinking, if they don't know what they're doing, you need to, people need to look out for their female friends or other people. Yeah, nice. Thank that's you. really cool. Yeah, the second question was about the bad experience, but you actually yeah. answered it that yeah. you didn't have this. Thanks. And I think the unfair Anyone else the question? one last thing is the unfair comparison is because there are risks. I mean, if you took mushrooms and got into your car, it's probably not a good idea and bad things could happen. But what's interesting is that people live every day with the fact that in the United States, 25,000 people will die you know, driving while drunk, probably 20,000 people will, uh, women will be hit or abused by their drunken boyfriends. You know, at when I, I was on the board of Yale, we had 162 cases of sexual assault on the campus. Do you know how many were with people on psychedelics? Zero. How many were with people smoking weed? Zero. And how many were people drinking? 162. So if I came to you and said, oh, we definitely need to ban something, you'd be like, well, obviously we need to ban alcohol. But everyone's like, ah, you yeah. know, we all drank. It's okay. We accept that. It's fine. Um, and yet when one person takes psychedelics and, you know, and there's never a fight because psychedelics calms you down. But if they, you know, I don't know, get in their car and have an accident, everyone, everyone goes crazy because they're just not used to it and don't think of it as normal. I've been, uh, I've been reading a book recently about alcohol, and mm -hmm. I just think it's so underestimated on how bad it is. Yep. Um, and like, I don't understand, like, talk about marketing. It's been one of the best marketed drugs out there yep. that has so much negative, you know, consequences and that actions and even on people's mental health it's super super bad yes. yet everyone seems to see like it's like the most acceptable thing out there where they, the amount of effort that has gone into policing and stopping and some of these other drugs and i think what like, what on earth is going on it's just yeah. it doesn't make sense nope doesn't um nice so anyone else got any other questions And as you usually have questions. Oh, I was just going to put my hand up here. Hi, hi, Kevin. Um, hey. I, I'm going to order that book and read that on holiday, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, I was interested in some of the stuff you do 
away from business so you know mm -hmm. you're involved with human rights watch and things like that i mean how, how do you a find the time to do all these things and b um how do you get involved in that sort of stuff to begin with yeah so i've had two major nonprofit sort of lines one is on international <clears throat> large nonprofits. so i was on the board of doctors without borders then for 12 years human rights watch and then for seven years mercy corp uh, which is an enormous, like an Oxfam, it's an enormous organization operating in Africa and the Middle East. And so I was on one of those boards that didn't want any one time. <clears throat> you know, it's three board meetings a year, generally for a day. You have committee meetings in the meantime, so it's it's doable. Uh, one of the most enjoyable things is I would go on generally one trip a year or every two years. So I've, ha I've gone to some unusual places, like I spent a week in Iraq and went up to Mosul, uh which had been destroyed by isis i spent two days in gaza like no one's been to gaza um gaza lesbos to see refugees that had come over from syria i spent four days in bdbd BD, and when they proposed the idea i was like i don't even know what that is and bdbd BD is a refugee camp in uganda with two hundred and fifty thousand people and yet wow. most of us haven't heard of it it's all from south sudan They've come over the border, interestingly, from a Muslim country into a Christian country. They've been very open. And the international community is trying to build schools, trying to uh, provide food, medical care, because obviously a, a, an incredible crisis situation. It's been there for, I don't know, eight years. Um, so I just find these trips fascinating. I was trying to set up a trip to Ukraine this year, but security-wise, I couldn't, I couldn't get that through. Um, so I'm actually leading a trip to Israel for 50 executives at the end of the year um, that we're going to be meeting with like the president of Israel, Mossad, the government, uh, tech startups, uh, human rights activists, um, uh, orthodox um, uh, representatives, just to really get an understanding of what's happening there. You know, it's an important area in the Middle East. So I've always had this interest in international. And the second track is I've education. I've been on the board of Yale, I've been on the board of INSEAD, where I went to business school. And then we are the leading donors to the University of the People, which you probably haven't heard of, which is an online university for basically poor people around the world. It now has a, it's only 15 years old, it has 140,000 students where you can get a US accredited BA or MBA for about $1,000 a year. Um, and so refugees use it, <clears throat> people in Nigeria, South Sudan, you know, Syrian refugee camps, use it as well as some in the UK and the US. Very cool. That's really cool. Uh, anyone else got a question? Come on, Dan. Hi. Uh, first, I wanted to, to say I hope you enjoyed uh, Glastonbury. I might have seen you there. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but I wanted mm -hmm. to ask in terms of your music taste, if you've got like a particular subgenre of electronic music that you most like, or if there's like any particular artists or, or, yeah. or DJs that you're feeling recently. Um, yeah, I mean, it's down to DJs. So, um, and not all these people are incredibly famous, but uh, Brian Gallivanter is someone that I like a lot. That's he's played at two of my parties. Unders is a guy that I like a lot. Gold Cap is a guy that I like a lot. Um, uh, Kind of music, Satori, Bedouin. Those are the, the, that's sort of the genre I would say, which is like softer, interesting, creative electronic dance music. I don't like the Berlin style of just huge bass, boom, boom, boom. That that is a little rough for me. Um, so those are those are some good examples of people I like. Who did you like? Anna, at get... By the way, who did you like at Glastonbury? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I think in terms of the the artists that I didn't expect to like, I really yeah. liked Dua Lipa, who yeah. is kind of very far removed from uh, sure. some of the artists that you've named there. But in terms of artists that I did like, I really liked Hai Lung. Okay. So uh, they're like a kind of, I don't know, like almost like a metal band with really like kind of like tribal rhythms and my throat singing. And it's like mm -hmm. really weird stuff that maybe I wouldn't recommend too many psychedelics before putting on their <laughs> music that much on that trip. So, you know who I liked? I, I, you guys probably all know this band because it's English and I didn't know them, but The Streets or The Streets. Um, and live, I mean, you know, he's an incredible performer. And 
watching him be carried, you know, on his through the crowd. You know, they, they, he was on lying on his back, singing the song the entire time while he went through. I was like, that guy's a professional. Um, so, yeah, I, I find that just and Peggy Goo, I went to as well, who I thought was really good. I think Anders is organizing uh, a car meter rap song by. Uh, oh, nice. um, who is it by? A guy called Professor Green. Yeah, he's a British kind of uh, hip hop grime artist, grime artist. Yeah. Would you say grime or hip hop? Yeah, somewhere somewhere between pop pop grime, I'd say probably. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the questions you asked that I didn't answer is just you know how do you find time for these things? And what I would say to everyone is that there are phases in life, and so. Uh, I always tell people, you can do anything, you can't do everything. And so when I had, you know, three kids for 20 years at home, I didn't go to Burning Man. I didn't do half the stuff we were talking about here. I focused on doing a great job at home, taking the kids to school every day, making sure I spent time working and staying in shape. And I switched from doing a lot of team sports. I, used to, I played a lot of soccer and a lot of uh, basketball and things, but I switched over to triathlons because I could do that when I traveled on my own, stay in shape. And I really cut back on time with friends, time watching sports, time going to cool cultural events. Just didn't have time for all those things. And I was able to carve out some time to be on you know, one nonprofit board. And then when my kids went away, I could, it freed up a lot of time and I could start getting more into electronic dance music, do more festivals, uh, things like that because it opened up a bunch of time. So, you know, you have a lot of time in front of you. But the, the important thing, had, that one last thing, the important thing is don't do seven things badly. Do three things really well. And then in 15 years, you'll do a couple different things really well. Yeah, I think that's great advice is about don't try and do too many things. Just go do yeah. a couple of things really, really well and nail that. What, like, in terms of like, are there any tips that you have? Because I think this is always useful when you hear like maybe some more like granular detail. Like, how do you go about planning your day? Like, do you have any rituals around that? Because I'm a massive believer of habits over a long period of time ultimately drive success. So how do you, how do you approach that? You know, I, I don't think I have anything that's earth shattering. You know, you're trying to get back to everyone. Um, you're trying to be super efficient of what you spend time on and what you don't. I have the benefit of an executive assistant who I use quite effectively um, to do a lot of things that I don't want to do. I've always been good about as soon as you can financially, you know, outsource as much as you can. So, you know, I don't want to be spending, you know, 10 hours a week cooking, cleaning, doing stuff like that. It's better to have someone else do that the moment I could afford it. Obviously, when I was in my mid-20s, I couldn't afford that. Um, for example, I didn't, it was more important for me to have help around the house than it was to buy things. So even today, you know, I have one car in the United States and it's a $25,000 car. You'd be very disappointed because I don't really give a shit about cars. Um, uh, sorry for the car financing. But that's not where I spend my my focus, my time. I don't drive that much. And so I didn't have a car for a long time. But I did have more help around the house than other people did because my time is extremely valuable. And I need every hour for family, work, staying in shape. And if I have any leftover time, having fun. Have you named your car? I have a, a Hyundai, electric vehicle Hyundai. Uh, I had... <laughs> I did have a Tesla. Uh, I have a Tesla in France, um, but I'm, I'm I'm finding that the Hyundai is actually as good a car almost, and it is uh, much cheaper. And I'm, I have felt worse about the Elon Musk brand over time. I met him when he was 27, so I've known him a little bit for a long time, and now I'm finding him not to be a net contributor to society. <laughs> Controversial. That's I'm, great. Uh, I'm also cool. one of their interests. I'm quite involved with democratic politics in the United States. So I'm in touch with most of the politicians. Uh, I've spent time with Biden in the past. I had dinner at Kamala Harris house probably nine months ago um, and uh, follow that. So I'm not a, not a big Trump supporter. Uh, and so uh, Elon has gone down that path, which 
I don't feel great about. Yeah, I was surprised at some of his support for that. I think it's shocking. Um, I don't know what people are thinking. Yeah. I mean, how, how can anyone in their 20s who says to me, oh, I care about climate change, which is a very legitimate point, uh, and then want to support a candidate who has a platform of reopening coal plants? Who does that today? I mean, it's not even a debatable thing. There are things we could talk about that, I don't know, higher tax rates, lower tax rates, but climate change and coal plants are not really something we should be debating. Are we pleased that Biden stepped aside this week? Oh my God, yes. All of us in our own way did whatever we could. I uh, spoke to multiple senators. I met on Monday with Chuck Schumer who orchestrated the process. I met him Monday, the day after Biden stepped down. Um, I talked, you know, so yeah, all of us who are donors and around the table, we're desperately trying to do that. And I think you can see the results so far. I mean, it's unbelievable. 58,000 people registered to volunteer in two days. $250 million of contributions without holding a fundraiser. Yeah. No, and, it's, um, so, so much better. So yeah, no, better. I mean, Biden, uh, we all saw it, is, is, has actually had a good administration, but he's just too old. And all of us have, I mean, I'm sure everyone on this phone call has had a father or a grandfather or someone, you know, that at a certain point you just see it happens, it's going to happen to all of us, but uh, they're not what they were before. And that, that stuff does not get better over four years. What's your view then if uh, Trump gets in? Like, what does he think? What do you think that means for the rest of the world? So, I, I may be biased. I think it's terrible um, on, on the substance side. I mean, it just depends where you are politically, but you know, the judges he's appointing, you can see what they're doing. Uh, you know, abortion is on its way out. Birth control is being challenged. I mean, can I, I doubt many people on this call question the idea that birth control should be available. Um, and yet we have states that are trying to get rid of it. Um, so things like that, that are just insane. Couldn't even be part of the conversation in Europe because that's just a, a, a settled subject. Um, you know, he will give away Ukraine in 24 hours. And so if I were living in Europe, I wouldn't feel great about that. Uh, it seems like an insane idea. So the quality of people he had in the last administration was horrible. You know, if, if you, if I were looking at investing in Carmula and then I, my due diligence showed that 15 people on your team have been convicted of, of, you know, crimes, I'd be like, okay, I think that's a little bit of a red flag. And so, and not to mention you. And so, uh, and that's the case, you know, his campaign manager, his national security advisor, they've all been convicted of things. Yeah. Oh, that's mad. Yeah. So it's not even, you know, it's, it, to me, it's not even that debatable. I uh, uh, oh, agree. It's uh, it would be a, a real disaster. There's lots of people, obviously, that's still based in Ukraine on, on this call. So yeah, yeah. Uh, we're all uh, praying that doesn't happen. I know. Um, so I want. We've taken up a lot of your time, Kevin, and I um, I just have to say how grateful I am. Like mm. this is uh, probably one of the best uh, Friday calls we've ever had. So um, thank you so much, and really, really appreciate it. Uh, no, I'm happy to do uh, it, and I'm sorry we. I know we had to reschedule last time because I was uh, my trip changed. Uh, oh. But well, just, one last question. Yeah. I think. Wait, we've got one last question. Zer, go on. That wasn't a question, though. I was supposed to oh. do applause. Oh, you're, oh I, thought, I thought you were. Oh, you're trying to put an emoji. All right, okay, no problem <laughs> at all. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much, Kevin. Really, really appreciate it, and uh, look forward to seeing you in uh, New York in September. Sounds great. And congrats, everyone, on what you've built so far and what you're about to build. It's really nice to be a small part of it. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Thanks so much, Kevin. Cheers. Yeah. Bye.